Hello. Welcome to Ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales. I'm your host, Anthony Pavlich. It's been a bit since my last update, and so in this episode, I'll review a little bit of what I've been working on and provide some uh, new resources that I've been trying to uh, utilize. So, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's been interesting. Um, the title of this episode I labeled as The Struggle is Real. I think it's pretty appropriate, um, not only, I think, for me, but for a lot of others, um, especially in this time that we're in, um, the things that we're dealing with, uh, whether it be in our personal lives, whether it be in our careers, um, it just seems to be this overwhelming sense that life is hard, man. <laughs> and it just sometimes it feels like we struggle with finding the light at the end of the tunnel or being hopeful. I think that's a big thing, not having the sense of feeling as hopeful as we might have at one time. Um, so I kind of wanted to focus a little bit on that, uh, and especially specifically to, um, at least for me, for, for writing and trying to continue to pursue this. Um, this desire to create um, works that I, I'm actually um, passionate about. So yeah, a little bit of the update. Um, I'm still continuing work on this um, spec script that I mentioned in previous episodes. And um, it's been going well. Um, I'm closing in at about 100 pages now with this um, spec script, um, roughly at about 92, I believe it was, when I last left off. Um, some of the pages might get thrown out because they might be referencing scenes that are no longer valid, but um, I'm incredibly surprised that I've gotten where I've gotten. But I feel like there's still I'm still struggling with finding my own process, uh, still trying to find uh, a routine, um, which I think will be interesting. Um, as we continue to talk about um, some of the thoughts that I've I've had recently uh, through some of the materials, resources, articles that I continue to find or that pop up on my my radar um, as to how it actually changes my perspective on maybe beliefs that I had about certain things. Um, so, but it's going good. It's going well. Um, I think what's really cool is that. I have found that while I'm still working through how it, it kind of goes back to what I've been talking with with others about is this idea that, and I mentioned it too, I think in the last um, episode um, about wanting to find a process that that you feel comfortable with, but also to that you just have to keep showing up. Um, that's the main key, is, is there's no shortcut for the work. Um, it has to be done if you want anything of, of quality and value um, to be created. And it's really more about the showing up, not so much as the quote-unquote productivity that occurs in that time that you spend. I think, and that's one of the things that I think has come up recently, at least for me, is that we've seen, especially in our society, I think here in the West, um, this, this, this pressure of productivity. And if you're not being productive with your time, then you're just being wasteful. Um, you're just being very flippant or you're, you're, you're just not, it, it, it's the sense of you're not serious about whatever it is that you're doing if you're not being productive. And I think that idea of productivity has really, really come to a head in the sense that it's really, we've had to really look at it, especially since the, the pandemic hit. Um, this idea that, because it really did the pandemic, I think challenged us in a way to reevaluate maybe some long-standing beliefs we may have had, um, just the way we may have looked at our, our life, our careers, our responsibilities, um, just everything in general. I think it really 
put a spotlight on what, how, what are we, how are we doing the things that we're doing? And is it the best way? I, I kept hearing a lot about um, this notion of getting back to normal. Getting back, we can't, can't wait to get back to normal. But maybe the question should have been posed of what is normal? And is normal really the best way of doing things? Because we've been so conditioned for a long period of time of, of doing things in a certain way. Um, specifically, an example that I think a lot about is um, the way our work, our work um, day is structured. This idea that we have to work five days out of the week, the nine to five, you know, whatever schedule that we've been told that we need to follow to be quote unquote productive. Um, and that just got tossed out the window, you know, when, when everybody had to isolate and quarantine, the, the standard nine to five was no longer really appropriate, you know, especially with, um, especially for families that had to deal with a lot, you know, um, children weren't in school. Um, so they were home all the time. Um, you know, families having to juggle with multiple responsibilities on top of their responsibilities with work. If and or if they didn't have the work, you know, they were dealing with untold stresses of, you know, um, unemployment or being furloughed. Um, all these things that many, many people had to deal with, adjustments that had to be made, or some people found they had a lot more time. You know, you're not commuting. You know, I personally was commuting year, a couple, few years ago, um, spending huge portions of my day and week in a car, driving to work and then driving back home. Um, on average, I would spend anywhere between three hours and four hours every day in the car commuting to and from work. And, you know, now that time was, was completely Return to me. You know, I didn't have to commute anymore. Um, some people, that's what they found themselves. So there's these large chunks of time all of a sudden being restored to us. And what do we do with it? <laughs> you know, and there was a lot of things. Well, now we had more time to maybe pursue hobbies that we didn't necessarily were able to pursue during the, the hectic um, schedule that we were faced with before um, with reduced work hours or finding that you just had more time in the day. You know, um, you're able to take, you know, as there's been a lot of research saying that, you know, we need to take much, m many more breaks, you know, a, a bit smaller breaks, but you theoretically should be taking, you know, every between 10, 20 minutes for every hour to two hours of work that you're doing. Um, that changed as well. You know, people were able to, to, to spend more time um, just breaking away. You know, and I think too that the Zoom has changed our society as well. You know, this this and there's also been studies looked at too as well as with, with Zoom. You know, now people are are in these virtual meetings for a longer period of time throughout the day, and Zoom fatigue is actually a real thing. <laughs> um, so there's all this upheaval, you know, in in what was quote unquote normal, and some for the better, and you know, some that we've had to adapt through, and there's been some growing pains with. But I, I go back to this this standard work schedule, and I think that was something that should be challenged, and I think to a great degree has been challenged. That people, you don't have to be in an office to do your work. For a lot of the stuff that can be done virtually, we've we've had to adapt to do that, and so we found that, you know, we don't have to be in the office. <laughs> five days a week, you know, people can actually have lives outside of work, you know, we, we can actually balance that, you know, and still, still be quote unquote productive. And this idea too, of like being productive, if you're not doing something 24 seven, then you're, you know, maybe a, you're just, you're just not serious or all these negative words and adjectives to describe people that aren't, um, aren't living up to the standard. I think that we've set um, this impossible standard of um, produ production and producing, um, I think is really something I've, I personally have been looking at and trying to grapple with on what does that actually mean and what does quote unquote 
real success look like. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a little bit of a tangent going off on what um, I've been, you know, looking at my own process um, and trying to adjust and adapt. I think what the what the main thing that um, has been coming more and more is that. Productivity and success are what you individually make of it. Um, and it really comes down to what makes you happy in the sense of what do you just find enjoyment and from and what you do, what, what fulfillment, you know, as long as you're getting fulfillment on whatever it is that you do, then I think that is, that is the, the real barometer for success and for, for productivity. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that we can get bogged down with in terms of theories and these new, you know, all these productivity fads and life hacks. And it's really easy to get into a trap of where you're just substituting one method for another. And, and again, it's not to, to, to demonize techniques and methodologies. Because um, it's they can be very important, but they can also provide stability, you know, and they can provide structure and 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 in our lives, uh, especially when we're dealing with a lot in, in our life. Um, but it's more just again finding the balance, not being too rigid, um, but still being flexible to adapt and to change as we've had to. This pandemic has challenged us to. Uh, adjust and to be flexible and to make changes that we may have not been prepared for or necessarily wanted to do, but we move through it. Um, and for some of us, some of those six, those changes have, are, have lasting effects because they, they've made improvements where we thought we couldn't make improvements. Whether it's, uh, again, the way we structure our, our life, uh, the way we view work and uh, life. Uh, finding that, again, finding that balance between uh, those two responsibilities that we have, um, especially when it comes to families, our own personal health, health of others. Um, it's just, it's been very eye-opening. I think for, at least when I speak for myself personally, it, it really has um, made me reevaluate some things that I may have been overlooking. Um, so again, very, very long-winded way for me to kind of get into some of the stuff that um, I've been looking at or have been coming up that I've been trying to utilize um, in in my own process and practice. And specifically when it comes to to writing, I've been trying to maintain a consistent um, time period for, for writing. Um, I like to try to do it in the afternoons because um, I take breaks uh, for lunch um, with my, you know, um, full-time job, and I try to use that time as uh, my writing time. So um, I'll come in, um, maybe have my little beverage or you know, a little snack, and then I'll sit down and I'll, I'll start trying to keep hammering away at this spec script. And I think to a degree it has worked. Um, I think what was really interesting is I came across this author. Um, his name is Oliver Berkman, and I hope that I am pronouncing that correctly. Um, and he is a, um, an author of many books and, uh, uh a common col col columnist, um, for the Guardian newspaper. And I really cannot remember it. Sometimes it's very interesting where some of these, I get linked to some of these resources and these people and these articles. And I, I really sometimes forget like how the connection happened. Um, but he came across my radar and I went to his site and I signed up. He has a uh, twice monthly email newsletter um, called The Imperfectionist. And it's basically just an email newsletter that highlights different topics uh, on productivity, morality, the power of limits, um, and building a meaningful life in an age, if you will, as he, as he states it on his website. Um, it's, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the, um, the link in the show notes, but it's Oliver Berkman, um, dot com. 
um, just a little bit I've gleaned from his um, articles and columns. It's just, it's just fascinating. And I'm looking um, to start one of his books soon. Um, it's a, I love the title. It's The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. And I just um, really, really, really like that title. And I'm looking forward to picking up that book. But um, when I signed up for the newsletter, there was a link to a bunch of um, articles. Um, and I started reading them. And there was one in particular called Dailyish, and it really, I think, was the one that just really turned um, me on my head on the perspective that I had um, with process, productivity, um, and just trying to create. Um, and it was really, it was fascinating because he basically breaks it out um, as. He, he had talked to Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld, the, you know, the uh, great comedian, about the uh, quote-unquote Seinfeld technique, um, which was this productivity secret that um, supposedly explained how Jerry Seinfeld goes about his construction of uh, creating jokes and writing. And basically, the, the idea was you would take this giant wall calendar, you'd put up on your wall, and you would put a giant red X on... Uh, the day every day that you would write and the idea was that you would be able to visually see this chain of red x's and your whole focus was to not break this chain um but during this conversation with jerry seinfeld um <laughs> oliver had expressed basically almost like a, a bewilderment that jerry had about this um this 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 productivity um, a life hack, I guess you could call it. And I, the idea was that I think Jerry Seinfeld had found it very absurd was because in his mind, it did not seem like some sort of great trick or um, it really meant anything. Um, when we think about, again, this idea of productivity is that we have to have, we feel like it's almost an all-in proposition where you have to be uh, almost a perfectionist. You have to be daily grinding and just have to be so um, consistent and such, so rigid, I guess is the best way of putting it, so rigid on scheduling that no other method really would um, would allow for the productivity to occur. If if you didn't hammer it in, so to speak, every single day, that there was there was no way that anything would get done. And that again, this idea that I, I think this was what was really interesting too. That it, it all dovetailed in about the same time when I was conversing, um, I think, with my wife about this idea that. The great, the, the great axiom um, mantra is that um, if you do something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, both her and I really hate that saying. <laughs> we think it's just, it's very, the intent is good. And I think I understand the, the positive quality that you can glean from that statement. But a lot of times it it's, it again goes back to you you're never going to be able to do something without work so this idea that you yes you can find enjoyment in what you do but i think it's more of we need to we need to reframe our focus on it's not so much what it is that you do but you enjoy the pr going through the process of what it is that you enjoy doing or that you are able to just move through the process and because there there's never ever going to be a day when when you're doing something that you love where it's, it's not going to feel like a grind or not going to feel like work or not feel like you know because you might have a deadline you know you might have 50 other things that are happening um that are requiring your attention um or that you have to navigate in order to produce what it is that you're trying to produce. And so I think 
there are going to be the days where it's going to feel like a slog. You're just not going to feel like it. Um, that you're just, you, <laughs> what you may have created, you, you'll just look at it again. You're like, this is garbage. What am I doing? You're going to question, you know, basically all of your life, cho- life choices. And so it's, it just feels like it's impractical to think that every day of, of creation is going to be bliss when it's just, there, there, there's just too many variables in the thing that we call life, the dynamic nature of life, that is just not going to make that possible. There, you know, it, you know, if if you're raising a family, you you're going to have, you know, your family to responsibilities to deal with. Maybe on a day that's going to be a lot more stressful than other days. So, you know, it, there there's going to be a lot of, of pull. There's going to be a lot of ebbs and flows. So. Uh, Again, I feel like it's impractical every day of what we are are passionate about doing is going to be blissful. And I think this goes to this idea of what um, Oliver was was, um, trying to pinpoint with his discussion with Jerry Seinfeld is that um, if you if you put in the effort repeatedly over the long haul, then that's that's what will create success or that's what will create productivity for you um so for him it sounded like it wasn't necessarily uh, an astonishing system um that if you show up every day and you put in the work then you you would how how could you not gain something at the end of that um that just seems (laughs) that seems like common sense (laughs) so and I, I just found this fascinating because, again, it goes back to this idea where we, we are led to believe that if we aren't doing something every single day, then we're failures. You know, then, then we've somehow fallen off the wagon and we are just not worthy of, 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 of being productive or, or, or succeeding. And what what it is that we want to do, um, and then we obviously when you fall off, you you feel really bad. We get down on ourselves. We berate ourselves. We uh, of course I've done it again. I'm such such a loser, and then that affects our motivation uh, as well going forward, and it, it just gets us sometimes in that downward spiral where then we 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 have a hard time coming back up. Um, but this idea that he, um, he mentioned in this article was this, uh, he was a proponent of Dan Harris's excellent alternative, which is basically, um, aiming it to do daily ish. And, (laughs) and it's interesting because it, it seems like it would be daily ish. What does that mean? Well, you, you do it. Daily ish, just as bad as you just do it as as often as you can. Try to try to do it daily, but but you do it daily ish. You know, you, you just do it as often as you can. And it's just, it, it's fascinating because it, it's this idea essentially what the article is, and I I don't want to to harp on it too much because I I don't want to. Again, I'll put the link in. Uh, you'll be able to read it uh, because I just the way that. He was able to construct it out is it's just so eloquent, and I think he puts it in such a great way. But it really is just again this this idea that we can become bewitched by finding the right method, finding the right technique, finding the right process, and then I will be successful if I can just find out what's how somebody else did something. You know, uh, for me for writing, if I found out how Shonda Rhimes um, does writing or Neil Gaiman, how he does writing, or Stephen King, how any of these greats, how they do writing. Maybe if I just do what they do, then I will be successful. If I if I, this right technique, this right secret, then it can all open up for me. I f- I think what the idea is that 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 again that kind of gets us back into a little bit of the trap where we feel like it's this all or nothing. Where if I find this secret technique, then that's what's going to allow me to flourish. When 
it's almost as if it's impossible because when you, when you, especially when I've listened to a lot of these greats um, talk about writing and their process, every single person different. And that makes sense when you look at it in the context of we are all very unique. Yes, we may share traits. We may share um, certain um, idiosyncrasies. Um, I butcher that word, I know. Um, we may share certain personality quirks, but if we really distill it, every single person is going to have a completely different process of constructing whatever they do. And so why would it make sense that taking some other technique or process would work for us when we are our own unique individual? So I think it's good to take elements. You can borrow elements, but again, I think it, it I think it really is more beneficial when we start embracing and trusting in our own unique abilities um, and giving ourselves the freedom to not have all the answers. And it's okay to be lost. It's okay to be having no clue what to do or what is next. But just a letting go of this sense of control that we need to have. Again, and I'm, I'm talking more of like rigid, rigid control. I'm talking more of, um, because again, methodologies and techniques are, are, are great in moderation, I believe. I think there's elements that we can take and use and try to, but it's more of integrating them into our own personal process and processes that I think is more beneficial than trying to shoehorn a process completely in 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 our methodology um and i think that's what the big key is as i'm starting to see is is we need to and I, what i think what's great in this this article um that i touched on was and i'm just gonna read this last part i'll, I'll quote it and he says crucially it's also about getting you with all your weird hang-ups and neuroses and ulterior agendas and other psychological nonsense out of accomplishments way. Unquote. And I think that's what was really the key is is allowing ourselves the freedom to be ourselves and to get of our own way of accomplishing it, whatever it is that we want to accomplish. And I think that's what was really um, just. I was struck by it, um, being able to kind of look at it that way and and think about it like, well, wow, it it, it really isn't about. And I think this is where the, the eye opening thing came for me was, it really isn't about me, you know. It's I I think for a long time I was trying to diagnose me and how I can't keep a consistent schedule of writing or. Um, what is wrong that I can't bust out X amount of pages per day or per week or per whatever um, goal? Um, why why am I so horrible at just starting or finishing something? You know, I have all these great ideas and I start, but I can never finish. You know, when that isn't really the issue, and and I was kind of only so consumed by my quote unquote me that I kind of lost sight of what I kind of want to do in the first place is is to let my voice be heard is is to create works I think of of creative writing that go out in the world and do whatever it is they do um and I think when when I I think this happened for me like I think it was a few weeks ago when I came across this article and so I started feeling like kind of a shift happening um, so this great thing started happening where I started looking at more of the, the work itself in a weird way. Um, I know it sounds weird because it's like, well, you would think that if you're sitting down to write, that's, that is what you're thinking of. But I think, again, I think it was so, so fixated on 
the minutia of how I should how I should write that I think I lost sight of what it is that I want to write um, and just kind of keen in on the work itself and allowing the work itself to to um, bubble up and come forth and so I noticed that I was being a little bit more productive or I felt that using a better term, I felt that um, there was more engagement in the sense that it became a little bit easier to show up because I wasn't so necessarily consumed with worrying about whether I could start or keep going. It became more about the story itself started to, to pull me. It's like I would think about it more in the sense that it would fixate a little bit more in my mind, and I'd be working through scenes and construction of those scenes and through lines and themes and dialogue and character um, intentions and obstacles and what, what was going on in the actual story and how problem solving. And, and it's, it was very interesting finding, finding that. and. Feeling that pull of, I would just sit because I would sit there and I would think, oh, this is happening to my character in this this part. Does that make sense to what happened before? Or how did he get here? How was the connecting bit? Well, I used this element to connect it. That doesn't seem like that works as much. You know, and I started would start getting <laughs> actual like story construction i would start thinking about the work and yeah it, it's just it was a fascinating thing um so before we keep diving in a little bit um it might be a good part right here to uh take a break um or recollect some of the things that i i, I notated out and um we can be back for um you know, a little bit more of a deep dive. Um, I don't know. I, I tend to get a little bit of, you know, abstract sometimes. So I know I, I apologize if this was a little bit um, not as concrete um, or just a little bit um, rambly, uh, as I like to go on tangents. Um, but um, but yeah, we'll try. We'll try. We'll try and maybe shift a little bit and tie it into some specific um, examples. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll take a quick break. Um, for this message from the Ruminations Radio Network, and then we will be right back. Hey kids, it's Don Shanahan from the Cinephile Hissy Fit, one of the podcasts on the Ruminations Radio Network. If you've been enjoying this show, come listen to Will Johnson and I fight it out over cinema's best and worst on Cinephile Hissy Fit. Find us and all the great shows over on RuminationsRadioNetwork.com. All right, welcome back. Thanks again for listening to Ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales. Um, yeah, so we were discussing a little bit about productivity. Basically, the, the general theme I think we were talking about is like struggle can be real when we get wrapped up into feeling that we're not good enough, that we can't be successful, we can't um, maintain our productivity levels at these high, high standards. Um, and again, I think I think I want to make the distinction between um, if it got a little lost is I think this idea of showing up and working every day I think is a very important, and I think it, but it's more about putting the time in, and I think it's not to say that if you don't put like say for example you miss a day. That you should, you miss a day, whatever it is that you're focused on doing, you shouldn't beat yourself up and say that you're a failure, that you couldn't maintain consistency. Um, it's not beneficial because it's not, it's not helpful and it's not going to help you to, it's not a benefit. 
to helping you get back on, you know, to be consistent. Um, because again, I think it's important that if you show up, you're allowing the creative force, you're allowing the muse to show up when you show up. But I think it's also too, it's like we have to not shy away from the work and the process because it's those, it's like, you know, as we mentioned in one of the other episodes, The Atomic Habits by James Clear is that 1%. Because if you don't keep putting 1% on the 1% that you've done previously, then you're not going to have the wonderful um, results of your creation at the end of it. Um, because those 1% add up. And if you're not doing those 1% consistently, then you, you aren't going to be building upon your, your work. Um, so again, I think that's, that's why the work and the consistency is important, but I think what we're trying to get away from is this mentality that the all or nothing, that if you aren't, aren't showing up every single day, that, um, that you're at a loss or that you're never going to be successful. I think, again, success comes in different forms, but I think what also happens, too, is when we get out of our own way, and what I mean by my, out of our own way is when we stop worrying so much about whether we can or cannot do something, and we focus more on the work itself, then I think what ends up happening is that, one, two things happen, and this goes into um, um, another resource that I came across that I want to mention. But first, I think one of two things happens. I think what happens is that we, we allow the unconscious force that is driving a lot of our, our creative work to allow it to uh, guide us. But then also, I think we start establishing an underlying structure that then rebuilds a new habit to form. What I mean by that is that when you start allowing the work to be the driving force, then it helps restructure the foundation on which the habit of you showing up day in and day out to solidify. And then what ends up happening is that you don't have to, it doesn't, it quote unquote doesn't feel like a grind as much anymore because you're enjoying the process of allowing the creative work to move you through it. And then you don't have to worry so much about quote, yourself showing up all the time because now it's become a habit where it's just, you just do it. And that does, again, doesn't say that you're always going to love doing it. It, it does not mean that. And it does not mean that's what you have to chase after. Because that goes back into the trap what we were talking about earlier is that if we chase that and we fail, then it really impacts us more psychologically than if we do it this other way. Or at least we, we start reframing the way we look at the process. Um, and this brings me to um, another resource that I came across. Um, it's a book called, um, let me get the title again, The, oh, sorry, back to the, so it, it's, it's by an um, author. His name is Robert um, Fritz. And this book is called The Path of Least Resistance. Learning to become the creative force in your own life. And again, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll link uh, to this book so you can have it as a reference and you can and look at it. And it's this idea about, and it's interesting because it, 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 it touches a little bit on the other resource that I mentioned, Atomic Habits, is that you have to... Because James Clear talks about habits are formed because of the system in place that helps form it. And essentially, that's what Robert Fritz talks about in this book. And I, I just, I've started it, so I, I won't be able to get too much into it because I, I'm not that far along in, in the book myself. 
but the, the, the essence of it is about these underlying structures. So, and I think that goes back to what I was referencing with some of these theories and methodologies. There's, it's not necessarily that any of these methods or techniques are wrong. It's just, I think, again, it's a reframing of how to utilize these techniques, and these methodologies, and how we can um, maybe integrate them into our own process that will lay a foundation for lasting change, as opposed to it being just um, something that we are in it for a little bit and then we get out of it. And I think, I think that's why these two resources have have uh, had such a stronger effect on me, in in helping me reframe this, but also in, in have sensing this shift in my own uh, writing is because I think it, again it's tying into these structural um, keys um, because I think again it goes back to if your structure is strong if you have your foundation is solid then anything you build on top of that I think is going to have stronger impact because they're on something that is more solid not as fluid, something that is not. And so that's what he talks about is if you, the great thing is you can change your underlying structure. You think, and if you think about all of your habits, they are all built upon whatever system that you have currently. Um, and again, I, I'm going to be happy to try to expand on this more in detail once I get material um but i feel like if you have a system in place that is facilitating the behavior that you want to achieve or to manifest then that is what is going to have the lasting impact and therefore should be your focus um and so when I think back on my example of um, a routine, that's, that's probably why I've had such a harder time with, with routines is the system I had in place to try to, to, to establish and maintain that routine is, might be the incorrect one. And this idea of, like, he talks about if you think about structures, they they all gravitate towards <laughs> ways that are less resistant, which makes sense. Again, it's the be like water uh, concept that Lee talks a lot about. Um, be like water. Now, water can flow, and water can crash. So water does the exact same thing. It, it just it it navigates through areas of least resistance, and when we can adapt that mindset, I think it's a lot more freeing because then we can understand, okay, how can I establish a structure that will allow the least resistance for me to accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish? And when we start looking at it that way, I think it, it, it's, it, it then becomes um, a much more positive framework for us to work towards. And so that's, that's what I've been finding very fascinating. And again, this idea that if we then, then if I, if, I, if I build a structure that allows me to focus on the work itself, then I think that's more freeing because now I'm out of my way. And now it really is about the work. And then this structure will allow the least resistance for this work to be accomplished and for it to be. So, yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm working towards, man. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm just finding a little bit of, of, of success, at least for me personally. Um, I'm finding this change happening again. It's it's very it's very new, so I, I haven't had a lot of experience in it. But I'm I'm really excited about where it's going to take me. Um, what's going to happen? And 
I just, I think it's really cool. I just really think it's really cool stuff. And maybe at some point, then the struggle will not be as real. It will be, it will be still challenging. Uh, I, but I think there's a difference. I think there's a difference between struggle and challenge. I think challenge is a good force to uh, push us to improve, to get better, and to utilize new ways of, of, of elevating to uh, the next stage of our potential, which I think all of us have. The struggle, I feel like, is, is we're, we're just we're frustrated. We're stuck. We just don't feel hopeful. And I, and I think that's what we need a lot more of, is more hope. And I think that hopefully um, we will find new and wonderful ways to discover that. So uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have enjoyed this show, please subscribe from your favorite podcast platform so never miss another chapter. And head over to RuminationsRadioNetwork.com for more great podcasts featuring some of your favorite subjects as uh, retro feature culture, um, horror, music, video games, and, and much more. Again, that's RuminationsRadioNetwork.com. And if you want to get in touch with us or send us, uh, you know, love mail, hate mail, whatever you want to call it, uh, reach out at RuminationsRadio at gmail.com. Again, that's ruminationsradio at gmail.com. And we'll respond if you're nice and cool. Thanks again, everybody. Enjoy your day. The year is 2043. You're playing fantasy football. It is championship week. You're trying to set your lineup and you don't know what to do. Robert Griffin IV and his top target, Will Fuller the Sixth, have carried you all season, but they're facing a London Jaguars team that has the top defense in the league. Your other quarterback is a 66-year-old Tom Brady who's playing against the much more manageable Toronto Bengals. So you turn to Nick and Elijah of the 25 Yards Later podcast, a production of Sports Obsessive and Ruminations Radio Network. Be a champion. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.